<coughs> Hi everyone, <coughs> good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to Penelope and Florence for inviting me and uh, organising such a brilliant <coughs> session. It's been really fantastic so far, out of this world, one might even say. <coughs> <coughs> so I hope to uh, keep the momentum going. Um, I'm going to uh, try to, I guess, pick up on a couple of themes that have already come up to do with uh, the kind of weight of the past in talking about how certain kinds of science fiction deal with deep time <coughs> from the future uh, perspective, as it were. Um, so my aims, which I'm going to call the mission directive for the sake of the <laughs> session, um, uh, are to basically think a bit about the archaeological imagination uh, and how that works in, uh, again, as previous speakers have already covered, uh, in both our sort of um, uh, ordinary disciplinary uh, ways of talking and writing and in science fiction and fantasy uh, literature. Um, and uh, also, um, obviously, <clears throat> there's a sense in which um, looking at these kinds of works helps us think about how the wider public that doesn't read archaeology books but does read science fiction, um, although a Venn diagram of those thoughts is very <laughs> would be interesting, um, uh, is uh, helps us illuminate the kind of wider view of archaeology. And like other speakers, I'll be employing a sort of comparative case study approach because it's fun to talk about things we like. Um, and these are my case studies, uh, a bit about <coughs> uh, the world of Judge Dredd, um, a very compressed bit about the enormous world or universe of Warhammer 40,000, and a uh, sort of coda on uh, a work of science fiction literature, the book of the New Sun <coughs> by Gene Wolfe. And these parameters of my mission are very personal. I make no apology for that, really, um, as all of us have. Uh, selected some things we like, you know, and these are all coincidentally perhaps things that were created around the early 80s when I was sort of just uh, getting into this kind of stuff, I guess, and they stuck with me. Um, <clears throat> what I'm not going to talk about, although obviously... It's a rich subject and uh, is touched upon uh, by several other speakers. Is sort of xenoarchaeology, the archaeological study by f science fiction archaeologists of alien uh, worlds. <clears throat> and whilst again, uh, as has come up, uh, themes of, of uh, uh, impending or recent apocalypse are not um, irrelevant to any of my case studies, I'm not going to talk about those in a narrow sense, uh, which you know often seem to be evoked as simply. Uh, well, in a way, Memento Mori reminds us of how fragile our existence is. That's not what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about <coughs> more is, is sort of how antiquity is created in works of uh, imaginative fiction. And I'm particularly interested in the incorrigibility or the inscrutability of the past as presented in some of these uh, things I'm talking about, how uh, decrepitude is created, how antiquity is evoked, and how... Uh, the fundamental ineffability of the past um, is, is really sort of a magical quality in these particular works and how obviously that then compares with the archaeological imagination that we all presumably uh, possess. So uh, as each of these case studies is rather involved, I'll try to keep them tidy but uh, give a little bit of an overview and I'm sure uh, you're variously familiar with, with, uh, with different ones of these. Uh, there is a, a chronological order to my sequence, obviously, so I'm going from sort of now uh, or near future into deeper future or further future. Um, so Judge Dredd, <coughs> as I'm sure many are aware, is uh, a fictional future cop uh, who is the law and who uh, is obviously a satire of um, autocratic uh, rule. Um, his main sort of context as a character and all the other characters in uh, the Judge Dredd universe is not too distant from now. Mega City One, which is a uh, huge urban complex on the east coast of the United States and, well, North America, let's say, in the early 22nd century. Um, the timeline that gets from here to there <coughs> is enormously complicated and just a couple of highlights, really. So, obviously, this is a post apocalyptic scenario. Uh, in fact, post double apocalypse, actually, kind of, in that there is. Um, uh, an atomic war in the late 21st century, which sets up the conditions for the judges taking over uh, as government and law enforcement and military, 
Uh, and then subsequent to that, there is another Apocalypse War called the Apocalypse War uh, within the Judge Dredd main timeline. <clears throat> um, interestingly, though, what begins the process of creating Mega City One is not actually an apocalypse. It starts out as, as a sort of planning solution uh, to the problems of late, 21, uh, uh, late uh, 20th century urbanism, early 21st century urbanism. Um, this is a rendering of Mega City One, obviously, uh, particularly if you've seen the excellent recent Dread movie, uh, there's another vision there. Um, but just to give you a sense of scale, there is the Statue of Liberty, which has been moved up from its uh, buried location to take place next to the Statue of Justice in Mega City One. <coughs> um, a couple of other points mentioned there. So obviously I'm a Romanist, so I have to mention the reign of Judge Cal, uh, obviously based on Caligula, uh, as a sort of key character in one set of stories. So uh, the key thing about Mega City One is it's, it's massive, obviously. It is massive in scale and in, in every sense. Uh, Sort of all three dimensions, and it is big in terms of people, so about 800 million people at its peak, although that gets drastically reduced from time to time, and it's in a world of mega cities, so this has become a worldwide phenomenon uh, with basically in North America three major cities, Mega City 1, Mega City 2 on the west coast, uh, Texas City in the south, and then other around the world um, <coughs> conurbations in the south block. Of course, this is a future world that's quite like the early 1980s, so Soviet uh, American as that recent cover uh, illustrates uh, tension is a big thing. Uh, so there's various cities in, in, in Russia and of course Britsit uh, in mainly southern Britain, as we said. The uh, Calhab to the north is a wild zone of barbarous uh, folk in uh, <laughs> contemporary <laughs> Scotland. Um, now what's interesting for my purpose today <coughs> uh, is the concept of the undercity. Uh, which is shown uh, sort of schematically on this uh, kind of cross section <coughs> that um, I found on the internet, which shows the Mega City One sitting on top of the Undercity, which is intended obviously to represent really contemporary, uh, well, New York, Boston, Washington, basically the whole eastern seaboard uh, of uh, North America. Uh, but what's interesting, unlike certain other kind of post apocalyptic films, for example, Resident Evil, where characters move amongst the ruins of um, that, you know, our civilization, as it were. The Undercity is sealed, it is covered over, it is not gone, it is there, but it's lurking beneath the mega city. And I think that's kind of an interesting distinction. Uh, however, its characteristics are perhaps predictable. Uh, so it's, it's inhabited by various unsavory characters. Uh, given that there's been two different nuclear wars, obviously there's quite a lot of mutation, and that's one of the big themes in the Judge Dredd stories. Uh, other um, people uh, of ill repute, as far as the judges are concerned, uh, criminals, refugees, judges uh, who retire, go on a long walk, um, often into the Cursed Earth, which is the Rab Desert to the west, but also into the Undercity. And uh, as, again, you might expect, and as my first image actually from Nemesis the Warlock, another 2000 AD story, showed um, there are relics which people prize as sources of wealth. You know, again, pretty predictable stuff, really. Um, as, as a sidebar, it's worth noting that maybe we're not that far from this future, or and even, actually, things in our past which were futuristic and have now been sort of ignored for a while uh, evoke this. So this is a visualisation of, of a <coughs> plan concocted in the 50s to concrete over Soho and start building big tower blocks on top of that concrete um, mass. And there are you know, a few other plans of the same era for other parts of London. Um, so you know, it's been thought of already uh, as a real thing, a real world thing, and it may yet um, come to pass. A couple of frames here from um, stories collected uh, conveniently in a recent um, compendium of undercity stories. Uh, just to help you visualise the fact that you've got there a squad of judges descending, abseiling down to the top of a building under the concrete cap, which protects or separates the undercity and the mega city above. And here, a uh, squad of judges riding into Times Square. Uh, again, showing that it's, it's a ruin, yes, but it's not a real ruin, if you know what I mean. It's not completely uh, uh, destroyed, it's just uh, looking a bit dilapidated. 
Um, so just a couple of key themes to draw out of that. In some ways, it is a typical post-apocalyptic scenario <coughs> with uh, the nuclear war legacy very prominent. But um, the Undercity uh, is an interesting part of that, which is sort of paradoxically frozen in time. So it is a sort of fossil of the 20th century, um, but is also uh, like, much like some of the kind of horror um, uh, sort of characters we were hearing about earlier, the source of chaotic forces and uh, the uncanny. <coughs> and of course, also given that Judge Dredd is a satirical story, social stratification and how that works is, is very kind of transparently <coughs> projected uh, into the physical space. Much like Hive Cities in Warhammer 40,000, which segues into the next case study. Um, so um, for those of you unfamiliar with Games Workshop's uh, franchise Warhammer, um, a fantasy game was uh, uh, first produced and then a science fiction version. So fantasy game dates back, I guess, to the late 70s. Science fiction version, uh, first edition, came out in 1987. Um, and as the title suggests, <coughs> the main setting uh, is the 41st millennium, so quite far into the future. Warhammer 40,000 is a tabletop game, um, but it has spawned uh, rather a lot of uh, other universe building. <coughs> so of course, like role-playing games, uh, from which context it comes, there's a lot of rich world building in the game itself, but that's expanded in various ways. So. Uh, lots of novels um, and uh, computer games as well. And of course, at the heart of it um, are miniatures. So here's a few from uh, my, sorry, a friend's collection, <laughs> um, which uh, uh, just illustrates uh, the sort of thing. Uh, this may be peak geek for the session. I look forward to some competition. Um, <laughs> now, the timeline <coughs> for uh, 40K, as you'd expect, is quite extensive. Uh, again, just a few uh, highlights. So um, the sort of familiar world, if you like, uh, the Age of Terror is at the beginning of that. <clears throat> and then interestingly, there's um, a, a long period of considerable technological innovation, uh, but which by the 41st millennium is known as the Dark Age of Technology. And there's a sort of inversion of the concept of Dark Age there. So for us, the Dark Age, obviously an unfashionable term, in archaeology is a period of low tech, if you like, but in this universe, the Dark Age is actually the high tech period because all of that high tech has been forgotten. Because of the Age of Strife, uh, where the galactic civilization that humanity has become has sort of broken down and separated and fragmented, that is then re-established in the Age of the Imperium. Um, and uh, that happens through uh, what's called the Great Crusade, human sort of reconnection across the galaxy. And that, I've underlined that, and the time of ending, as it's known in the 41st uh, millennium, as the two key timelines, actually, that action takes place within the game and the books uh, of the uh, Warhammer universe. So, interestingly, even within this sort of, as I say, it's a very rich uh, universe, there are two kind of timelines <coughs> within which narratives take place, separated by 10,000 years, which is kind of part of the... Um, the building of antiquity within the game world. Uh, so the main concept, uh, again, I guess, is uh, there is a, a very large human empire spanning a million worlds. <coughs> and uh, there, are, there are, of course, various other uh, um, antagonists, mainly for that human empire, various species of aliens, all pretty much based in Tolkien-esque stereotypes, so orcs and elves and that sort of thing, uh, forces of chaos, fairly heavily influenced by Michael Moorcock's uh, vision of chaos and uh, the concept of um, a sort of parallel universe known as the warp, which makes interstellar space travel possible. Um, just to focus on Terra, the Earth, as the heart of that galactic empire, because <coughs> my focus is, is terrestrial uh, antiquity in the future. Um, in the 41st millennium, Terra is massively transformed in lots of ways from how we understand it now. <clears throat> it is a bit like Coruscant in Star Wars. It's a world city, uh, which is completely covered really by um, buildings of one sort or another. Uh, big sort of tower blocks like the, the um, city blocks in Mega City 1, known as hives, 
there are orbital plates, so um, sort of atmospheric platforms which orbit the Earth, which are kind of high status residences, um, and the Imperial Palace, the hub of all this, which is interestingly situated in the Himalayas, uh, where the Emperor sits on his golden throne. Now, the thing about the Emperor is he's basically almost dead and uh, only kept alive by uh, a sort of innate psychic. Uh, power. <clears throat> so the idea of decay is built into the whole concept of the empire. It's an extremely kind of gothic uh, vision of the future, and as this also suggests. So there is a, a palpable sense of antiquity, and I've got a couple of extracts here to illustrate this from two different novels, and I will read these out for the, the recording uh, benefit. Um, so this is uh, from Prospero Burns, a novel by Dan Abnett, <clears throat> set in the 30k timeline. Uh, the cathedral was a giant corpse building. It had died as a place of worship during the 19th War of European Succession 3,000 years earlier. And since then, its structure had been put to other uses. A parliament hall for three centuries, a mausoleum, an iceworks, an almshouse, and latterly, a market when the last of the roof fell in. For the last 800 or so years, it had been an empty husk, a physicalized memory, lifting its rusting iron ribs at the overcast sky. There were cellars down there, deep under the foundation the basements of previous incarnations, cisterns buried under the sub-fabric of later builds. Some said, if you could trace your way down through the dark, you'd reach the centre of the earth and the catacombs of old Frank. So this is set uh, effectively in Paris. Uh, so Lutetia, the sort of gallery Roman city, came before Paris. And obviously there's a real-world reference there, but it's really kind of uh, somewhat deliberately, obviously, obscured. Uh, and this is very much like an account you might think of, something like um, uh, the uh, Bath Basilica in Roxeter, which becomes a, a marketplace later in its life. And, you know, that kind of sequence of, of, of uh, stages of real archaeological sites. But this uh, extract conveys the um, antiquity within the future, as it were. So <clears throat> this is from a 40k setting, a book about the Inquisition, which is a major uh, force in uh, well, uh, sort of policing uh, terror far to the north, past Skilax, burn off chimneys, that's a, another sort of city. Uh, he could just make out the greater mass of the outer palace zones where the march of the Habspires was replaced by the Ministorum's temples and ceremonial plazas, piled atop one another like coralline outgrowths, suffocating the old under the accretions of the new in a maze of competing holiness. Of course, new was a relative term. No cathedrals have been built on terror for over 4,000 years. Keeping the old ones from falling in on themselves was task enough for the millions of ecclesiarchy work gangs toiling eternally in the crypts and the aisles and the slowly sinking foundations, while the priests swung censers and slaughtered offerings on their ancient altars. I wonder, Rebus, if anyone noticed, mused Crow, watching the hump of the palace's distant parapet slip out of view, when we stopped building. So a key point here really is, you know, in this far future, there is so much kind of stuff that people don't build stuff anymore because antiquity is weighing upon them so greatly. And I think this is an interesting theme. <clears throat> so just to pull out of that, <clears throat> also what I mentioned earlier, this idea of the dark age of technology as a forgotten high tech period. Uh, and uh, basically there's a whole concept of technology there developed uh, to do with what's called STC, standard template constructs, which allow construction of advanced robotics and, and so on. Uh, but by the 41st millennium, that has been so sort of corrupted, if you like, that it's become a theological uh, system rather than a technological system. And then this pressure of antiquity, that the buildings uh, uh, as ancient and uh, innovation being stifled by the overwhelming materiality of the planet. My final case study then picks that theme up. <clears throat> um, so the book's A New Sun by Gene Wolfe is for uh, connected novels, um, I think this is there, um, set on Earth uh, in the very far future. The main setting is uh, a region called the Commonwealth, which is kind of in South America. <clears throat> um, a couple of key cities involved, and the timeline is ambiguous, so it could be up to a million years in the future, but there's kind of debate. So this is interestingly one of those fictional worlds that has quite a substantial secondary literature um, and sort of speculation about what's going on in these novels. <clears throat> Key point really is that the sun is dying, but uh, the one of the sort of conceits <coughs> is that that leads you to believe this might be 
you know, billions of years in the future when that might happen naturally, but actually there's a few clues that the sun has been artificially um, set on a destructive course by somebody implanting a black hole uh, in the heart of the sun. Um, and that means it's a little bit shorter than uh, we think. Um, again, there's a sort of long timeline. I won't go into detail as I'm running out of time here. But uh, one point to mention is that, um, uh, again, obviously you've got a sort of human expansion, intergalactic empires, uh, the kind of context of the, the main stories. <clears throat> and in this set of stories, there is also a future future, uh, because time travel is possible. and a character travels to the book's timeline from its own future, if you see what I mean. So there's a kind of multi-layered temporality. Uh, and uh, th as I say, there's a secondary literature, so sort of di dictionary of, of stuff mentioned in the books, a role-playing game. Uh, again, very useful for source material for this talk, actually. Uh, but the plot revolves around a particular character, Severian uh, the Torturer, uh, who travels around this place. <clears throat> The narrative is convoluted, uh, he's an unreliable narrator, there's time travel, so it's quite confusing, and part of the sort of evocation of that future um, antiquity is this sort of rather slippery temporal, particularly temporal ambiguity, <clears throat> because um, the acute weight of history by this point really is robbing time of meaning, so sequence and, and chronology are all uh, rather less important than they might be to us. Um, there is also, to use a term uh, coined, well, or used by uh, Matt Edgeworth and others, a very dense archaeosphere. So the world is covered in stuff. You know, there's a sort of crust of humanity, uh, humanity's leavings uh, around the planet. And uh, this image here, which illustrates the excerpt I'm about to read, alludes to this. This whole cliff face is um, archaeological, if you like. Um, so just one extract from this text. Um, so Severian on his wanderings descends a cliff face, um, perhaps because I was forced to labour so hard to ignore the drop on the opposite <coughs> side, I became acutely conscious of the vast section sample of the world's crust down which I crawled. The past stood at my shoulder, naked and defenceless as all dead things, <clears throat> as though it were time itself that had been laid open by the fall of the mountain. Fossil bones protruded from the surface in places, the bones of mighty animals and of men. The forest had set its own dead there as well stumps and limbs that time had turned to stone so that I wondered as I descended if it might not be that earth is not as we assume older than her daughters the trees and imagine them growing in the emptiness before the face of the sun tree clinging to tree with tangled roots and interlacing twigs until at last their accumulation became our earth and they only the nap of her garment deeper than these lay the buildings and mechanisms of humanity so there's fossil forests on top of archaeology uh, in this future. So um, just to finish up here, this is you know, uh, very kind of complex and rich <coughs> universe again. Uh, Gene Wolfe uh, often talks about it as <coughs> post-history because of this temporal ambiguity. People have forgotten how to remember almost, and, and chronology and, uh, and archaeology, I guess, is sort of meaningless because of this weight of history and also the confusion created by time travel. And uh, again, though this is sort of evoked by forgotten technology, so uh, the castle uh, of the Altarch in Nessus is mostly interpreted by secondary um, writers as a, an abandoned spaceport. So the idea of something futuristic becoming something which is to us anti antique, a castle, uh, is sort of an interesting temporal uh, flip there. There's another bit uh, where Severian sees somebody cleaning a, a really old picture, which turns out to be a picture of an Apollo astronaut. So um, where does all this lead us? Well, uh, mainly it was fun to do this paper for me, uh, and I think uh, a little bit of fun for you to listen to it. But I think there's something here to do with what science fiction helps us think about in terms of communicating the archaeological process and the archaeological um, resource, uh, I guess. Um, but more than that, whether, like these writers, we're interested in the past really as it was, or are we interested in the past as it is, i.e. are we interested in the past in its ruined state, and how do we preserve that uh, interest uh, in that ruined state? Interesting sort of question of when there's going to be too much past, <clears throat> and I was thinking, listening to some of the papers earlier, is there already too much past? 
Uh, and maybe that's actually sort of a good thing in the sense that the past being a bit broken and a bit inscrutable is the only thing that keeps us going from, from going completely mad. Because if we try to relive the past as it was, what are we doing in our own time? There is simply too much um, of the past to piece it all together now. We need to sort of focus a bit more on our own present and, you know, synthesize, I guess, is the key point there. Um, but then also the theme that's come up before of how we can prepare for future pasts and preempt or not future forgetting. I'll just finish with these two quotes, uh, which kind of sum up the imaginative exercise extended both into the future and the past from Ursula Le Guin <coughs> and from Jean Wolfe. I particularly like what Ursula Le Guin says there about how difficult it is to imagine a future language that doesn't exist, but no need to exaggerate. The past is just as obscure as the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.